Hey y'all, Tara May here. I'm going to do a movie review for Phantasm. This movie came out in 1978, which was the year before I was born. And uh, it is a very remarkable film. It has stood the test of time. It has spurned sequels spanning all the way to last year, which uh, the last one was finally done. Um, they're good about reusing the same characters and um, the, getting the same actors back and stuff like that. So. I wanted to do one on the first movie. It is um, such a strange, unique, and somewhat artistic film. It's very dark. The way Don Coscarelli, who directed this, described what Phantasm meant to him was pretty much the word nightmares. He said that the person that used the word most that he ever saw was Edgar Allan Poe. And um, that's where he really, I guess, was fueled with this idea. The movie... Um, has a couple of very iconic images most of you would recognize. Now this was my old DVD. I have recently upgraded, but I love the cover of it so. And I have recently given this to my mother actually. <laughs> She's a fan as well. Um, you see the tall man back here. He's a very iconic figure. And this sphere that's on the front, that's also the tall man right in front of there. Both of those things are synonymous with this movie franchise and it's something a lot of people recognize instantly when they see it. You got the tall man who repeatedly says, boy I can't quite do it like him but you get the idea and the sphere itself it just it has these blades and they kind of you know stick out they go in people's skulls blood sparks everywhere and it's you know a little bit graphic um these things were uh, at the time you know you didn't really see well you never saw a sphere like that and to be honest uh, other than well, I'd like to see Harry Potter try to play Quidditch with one of those <laughs> But I don't think anybody's ever quite had the idea to do that, so it was pretty unique. And um, it takes place mostly in a mortuary around a cemetery in a small town. There's a boy named Mike who suspects the Morningside Mortuary, um, the tall man that runs it, he suspects him of some sort of mischievous doing, so he's been kind of skulking around there. Um, we find out that his parents have recently died and his older brother Jody is actually taking care of him right now, but he may plan to leave. So Mike, he doesn't want his brother to leave, but he also wants to get to the bottom of what's going on. And he's a little bit of a, a little bit of a rebel and a little bit of a badass. And he's rather kind of inventive in certain scenes in this. I don't want to spoil anything for those of you who haven't actually got to see this yet. But, uh, he does a couple of rather inventive things in the movie to, um, you know, get himself out of trouble or to get himself, you know, into finding out more information. It takes a lot of odd twists and turns and dark, you know, just dark images and, you know, just things that stick with you. There's this um, sort of eerie music that plays and just sometimes you're just shown a very strange scene. Um, and even though this fear is such an iconic part of it, you actually, unfortunately, don't get to see a whole lot of it in action in the first film. Uh, watching some of these special features and stuff that I have on some of my movies, uh, for instance, I have upgraded to the Arrow video box set, which I've done the unboxing on my channel, some of you may have seen that, which does include, for those who haven't seen it, the sphere, uh, kind of in part, you put it together, nice shiny uh, little piece of the movie right there. and. The special features go into some detail in these things, uh, and doesn't really show you the list of the special features on here, but you can go look at the, the disc that I have. Don Coscarelli talked about how it was actually kind of quite uh, coincidental when they were shooting the sphere, um, when it's in the one victim's head. You can see his reflection, and he's having to watch himself as he dies as this sphere just kind of drains him from, you know, his skull and see that terror in his own eyes. And it actually wasn't something they purposely did or thought of. It just kind of happened for him. They talked about how uh, they tried all these different things to find a way to light the sphere so that you would really see it until they finally realized, since it's so reflective, they needed to light what was reflecting out of the sphere, and that would in turn light the sphere. It's pretty interesting stuff. There are some old um, documentary footage where uh, he sits down with Angus Scrim on an old talk show and talks about the movie and stuff and whether or not he'd return to horror. And um, it's it's all pretty interesting to listen to him about how he came up with the idea. This movie has an ending that I'm sure most people would be, at least the initial viewing, be confused by. And 
when I first saw it, I was probably 18 or 19, and I was just up late one night. It was on cable. I realized I'd never seen it before somehow, and I sat down and watched it. I was kind of blown away a little bit, but the ending, I was just like, what? What did I just see? I don't want to spoil the ending. I don't want to give anything away, you know, or anything like that. For Like I said, I'm sure some of you may not have seen this yet. And um, there are two really, really nice box sets out there. Or you could just pick up the first movie as a remaster. You might want to skip the sequels. I mean, that would be up to you. Although I do think the sequels are worth a watch because they do try to go in and further explain certain things going on. And like I said, it's fun to watch the characters keep coming back. But aside from that, um, it's just one of those kind of movies that it, it haunts you, uh, you know, of course. And it sticks with you and it makes you think. And yeah, you do kind of wonder, what did I just see? And you kind of have to watch it again just to like, to be sure what you just saw in a way because you're still trying to figure out. But it really is, it comes down to simply how Don Coscarelli views it, you know, the term phantasm. So, you know, you might want to keep that in mind when you watch it. Uh, and it kind of makes the ending make more sense for, you know, just, just knowing that. But it's just one of those kind of um, movies I would recommend anybody into horror, especially if you like those uh, kind of creep me atmospheric things and just bizarre. And it definitely has a hard sci-fi edge in there. There's definitely some things uh, going on in the movie that definitely go into the sci-fi realm. There's, you know, um, a sort of another dimension type thing going on at one point. I don't think that gives too much away, you know. Uh, and just the way they work that in. And you'll see these little, they look like evil Jawas. Um, and as I said in my unboxing, I used to call them evil dank dates because I kept thinking of space balls and how the little, the little mock Jawas were singing that dank dank song as they're going across the desert. And so, yeah, it was just, it struck me as amusing at the time. So, but it's actually a really fun movie. And there's times that like something happens so suddenly. I'm sure some people in the past with VCRs, they would rewind the tape or, you know, you back up a little bit, maybe even go in slow-mo if you've got that feature on uh, the DVDs and stuff like that. You used to be able to do that. Um, but the Blu-rays look great. I've probably, I've never seen the movie look better as, as it does on my Blu-ray version there. And it's great to see that because the imagery really hits you. That box set um, I was showing you, that actually looks like a little piece of the inside of the Morningside Mortuary there that uh, Mike goes into. And Mike, he's played by A. Michael Baldwin. Um, you'll see that it just says Michael Baldwin in the first film most of the time. Uh, I guess later his first name must have really started with A. Uh, Reggie Bannister, he's a character that keeps coming back. And um, he's very fun. Um, very fun to watch. He's just, the way uh, they use his character is just, it's priceless. Just the things that he's, he's kind of got shit luck, you know. But it's uh, pretty fun. And yeah, I mean, it's a great great movie, great piece of late 70s, you know, atmosphere, it borders the sci-fi, you know, and it fits well into any good horror collection and stuff, and I would recommend anybody seeing it, and I really just want to kind of get my thoughts out there. The, uh, the features on the Arrow set, they've been really great, like I said, and I haven't watched the specific bonus disc, I've just watched the bonuses on some of the, you know, discs I've watched through a couple of the movies so far, and so I just, I realized I'd never covered this movie. And there's a lot of great art you can look up. Like, if you Google the art for Phantasm, there is a lot of very inspired artwork, you know. And even the covers alone, the old posters and stuff like that. And as you can see, that old DVD, it actually had a lot of features on it. Um, if you can read that. And some of those features were transitioned onto the Arrow set because I had actually, that little talk show segment had been on this. Um, Scream Factory has put out Phantasm 2, I believe it is. Um, and some of the stuff that they had used, I believe, is on the second Phantasm movie of this set also. Um, and then there's, uh, I think it's Wellgo, I'm not sure, is the name of the other people that put out a really nice box set that have the interchangeable covers and stuff. Some of them have the spheres. Um, when you get to the second movie, they do start having more spheres, so that's something to look out for if you do want to watch the sequels. And they have different uh, things that they'll do. One of them, I believe, is gold instead of silver. And some of them, you know, they'll drill or something like that and it's just fun to watch how they utilize these and, and keep bringing them back so, and I think anyone has seen the sphere of you know you, you see murals or collage pictures and stuff of horror icons in the sphere usually and or the tall man make it into 
the imagery usually somewhere. So it's definitely something that's always stood out for people. And it's something that doesn't quite leave you. It does stay in your mind. So I would definitely encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to watch this, like I said, because it's just, um, it's just beautifully done in a way. And it's just kind of out there. And like I said, it doesn't really leave your mind at all. So, um, I'm sure I've repeated myself enough by now, so I will go. So, I hope you liked my uh, little review, and um, I hope it did inspire you to watch the movie or pick up one of the sets or something like that, just because, I, you know, they are limited, the sets, or maybe pick up the remaster movie, you know, on Blu-ray, something like that. Um, give it a watch, you know, heck, watch it on, you know, whatever format you can find it on, watch it on YouTube if YouTube has it, you know, something, but definitely give it a watch, you know, and revisit it if you haven't watched it in a while, especially if you've got any of the upgrades, because they're really worth it, and uh, especially if you're interested to know more of the thought process that went behind it, um, these features are great, uh, in-depth look into that, plus there's a really nice book in there that says a lot about the movies too, so that's uh, something if you wanted to pick that particular set up to look forward to. All right, so like if you liked it, um, subscribe to my channel, or you can follow me on Twitter at TaraMay79, that's T-A-R-A-M-A-E-7-9, and uh, I'll be bringing you more reviews hopefully soon, and uh, yeah, I'll be doing some horror pack unboxing, stuff like that. So until next time, I hope you all have a good day.